Well, after all this insight, I'm going to take you guys back to something very simple, which is actually called what is decentralized? Because we have been talking about a lot of things today. And I want to take you guys back. I'm going to do that through some screen sharing, I hope. And I'm going to be able to pull this off. Am I in? Let me see if this works, guys. I'm having the same issue, I think. Let me see if this works. Okay. Am I in here? How do I do this? Let me see. I'm not clicking here. Hold on. Where do I click? On this other screen, I have to go out. Where? I'm getting help here by an unknown hand. Okay. Let me get my presentation started. Bear with me, guys. What am I doing here? Okay, there we are, I think. Everybody can see this? I hope we can see it. I have to thank Fabian Xu, Dr. Fabian Xu, for doing the preparation for this presentation. I have talked about this before, decentralized blockchains, because decentralized is one of the most abused words in the whole economic space of this very moment. If you would talk to a traditional bank, they would say that decentralized means they have two data centers, one in North America and one in Europe which is not exactly what we understand when we talk decentralized in decentralized finance. Decentralized finance means that there's not one finger on the bottom. We heard George explain a lot about um, the fact that there is a trustless situation that is permissionless and it's non-corruptible. Many of our speakers have referred to decentralized finance issues, but on the bottom of all of this is decentralized blockchain technology. And I want to take everybody back to some real basics here, because what's actually decentralized blockchain? We've got some typical proper, pro, uh, properties for that, also some very untypical and some non-properties for decentralization. I just want to take you through it in sort of, um, well, I would say a high flyover of course, there are many details to be sent, but I want to put people back at the awareness. Are you really dealing with something decentralized or is it something else that's just been called decentralized because it's nice to market it that way? So if we go to how you compare actually decentralized, are you going to do it by just adding it up? Are you going to have a percentage assigned to a decentralized situation to say, okay, it's 70% decentralized? Or are you going to do something else with it? I think the quick conclusion is that there is not such a terminology that you can say this is decentralized and that's not. We have to see to degrees of decentralization into the many aspects of decentralized blockchains. And I think it is good with all these new developments, which also opens up a large corner of marketing technology in decentralized finance, that we keep our feet on the ground and our heads together as to what it actually is. If we look at um, some typical prop properties for decentralized, I think the critical point to always watch out for, is there a single point of failure? If there's one finger on the button, if there's one person turning the key, it's not a decentralized situation in the sense that you can claim all the privileges that George talked about, it's not gonna give the prosperity to, I would say, large communities that Monica talked about, and it for sure needs something like decentralized uh, identity, digital identity, like Eric referred to. I think you need to have a lot of barriers to enter into block production. I think there needs to be geographic um, separation, you know, just for latency purposes, you know, if all of your nodes are in Southeast Asia, your latency in Africa is going to be horrible. So this separation is also a way of decentralization. If we look further, we have also have some untypical properties of decentralized. 
you know, we have protocol upgrades, governance issues, funding things like for development and marketing. Is this essential for decentralized? Not really, but it's got a lot to do with it, basically. So you have to be aware of these items. I think one of the main things that I wanted to take you to is the non-properties of decentralized, okay? Use of a particular consensus mechanism, existence of redundancy, are you public? Are you transparent? What about your tokens? How is your supply organized? Is there a P2P network? What about your liabilities? We all know about the regulatory issues we had after 2017, early 2018, whether things are uh, security, are a utility, are in a certain jurisdiction, are decentralized. And I think one of the other things is, it doesn't really matter which cryptography I mean, Ethereum is not Metaverse DNA. The cryptography is entirely different, and still both are going to be or are decentralized. I think if we look a step further, how do you actually become decentralized? Because just saying that you are is not cutting the edge. You need to be really be decentralized in order to claim trustless, permissionless, adaptable, uh, access for everybody, global in an instant. And I think one of the major issues here is governance. We've seen a lot of issues over the past three to five years where governance issues have had a large influence. George referred to some instances with exchanges. We've seen them in uh, blockchains, we've seen them in exchanges, we've seen them in countries, in developments, in stable coins. So I want to talk a little bit about some awareness in this corner of governance, because it's something that's very important. If we talk digital identity, a neighbor of that is sovereign identity. There's a lot of discussion about that. It basically means that you as a citizen get more control over your own identity uh, versus the government having it now. Now, we also heard Andy Tang already discuss that it's very hard to be in disruptive technologies in this government area. It has to have a push like the pandemic. I don't see them giving up a lot of their rights and the things that they hold. Basically, governments are data slurpers because of what they make the living off. We heard Eric, Eric talk about how companies make money out of your data, out of everything that you do. But governments don't make money of it. They basically get control over a lot of things. So to get that back, I don't see that happening very soon, other than out of necessity and cost efficiency. But when it comes to decentralized blockchains, of course, governance is just as important. Who rules the show, basically? Who is issuing this token? What's the supply going to be? Is it limited? How do you select your block producers? All these things have to do with governance. And I think it's very important that we are aware that this basically means, are you decentralized or not? So there's some, op some options here, just the gross total. There can be a common enterprise in charge. Well, I think it is very, I'm very realistic to say, if you have a single point of failure, which is an entity that leads everything, then you are not decentralized. Option B is, of course, that you are guerrilla style, which means nothing is arranged. So that means everybody can do anything or nobody can do anything, which basically means that you are depending on initiatives of individuals and, you know, you have to wait if that's successful or not. It's basically a community effort and you can be lucky or you can be very unlucky and nothing gets done. Option C is sort of a mixture, decentralized, but with a certain amount of governance, which means there are rules, there are things that are arranged. Um, I think the most adaptive one is option D that I listed here. A centralized start with a gradual decentralization, because in the first instance, you will need development, you will need to be adaptable to use cases, you need to be able to have economic presence by enabling people to get on your decentralized blockchain and do things on it. So to build it up and to gradually release it, like um, for instance, the fees. If uh, there gets traction on a decentralized blockchain, the fees can go into maybe a working pool and that working pool can have 
voting rights as to where it's going to go, that money is it going to go to adapting a new mobile app, is it going to go to this, to that, has to go to maintenance, you have to have block producers, you have to have witnesses, there's a whole organizational overhead. I think option C and D carry in them that these involves cost. So all these systems require a certain methodology to arrange for how these costs are going to be met. If there's no marketing, you're very lucky if it's going to be successful. So if you have a way of arranging that, um, the chances of success are larger for a wider adoption. One of the other things is ease of use. We saw that with Ethereum. It enabled a lot of people to come on to uh, the Ethereum blockchain to do dApps and, and all sorts of developments. So there are various ways in how a decentralized blockchain can be successful. I think one of the um, major things that I wanted to refer to is when you hear the word decentralized, be very aware. Is it really decentralized and how decentralized is it? Does it mean that there is a single point of failure? Then you are at risk with your value, your store of value, your transmitting of value. It's not unsafe because the whole traditional banking system is a system that is a single point of failure. 2008 proved that. Governments needed to come to the rescue of banks, needed to keep them upright because they were too big to fail. But the essence of it is they were not decentralized and they were a single point of failure. And now with the pandemic worldwide, we run that same risk. We are at risk at this moment. We do have single points of failure. We see our airlines come into trouble, basically losing us our vital point of connectivity to other parts of the world, because whether you're green or not, there's always going to be flying. There are other single points of failure that proves that decentralization is a much better way forward. Decentralization will also give communities like Monica was talking about the opportunity to develop, to have their own GDP, to not be so dependent on systems that basically were not successful for them in the past. And I see if I talk to Vince about his sustainable development goals, preliminary in underbanked or unprivileged societies worldwide, we have been spending um, giving money for 40 years ever since I can remember. It was not successful. I sincerely hope that decentralized finance is going to be a new, I would say a new dawn, a paradigm shift for all these communities.